I have to kill all these characters in narratively impactful, thematically sound ways. Any normal person would slip under these circumstances. But it won't be that easy with me, unnamed rant reviewer. This is the closest you'll get! <laughs> <laughs> I've set things up so that characters will continue to die over the next two books. Reviewers are aware by now that fake-out deaths exist. Therefore, to avoid suspicion, I'll have to kill the characters in extra creative ways. I'm gonna show you, random reviewer! With beta feedback and my preparations, I can continue to kill beloved characters while masquerading as a writer killing for narrative reasons. Just watch me, random reviewer. I'll kill characters with my right hand and tweet with my left. I'll take a potato chip and eat it! Characters can be quite the undertaking. Sometimes it's necessary, sometimes it's fun, and sometimes we f it up. So here's a script that I started over a year ago that will maybe help you not f it up. So the first thing that you need to properly kill a character is an ironclad motive. This is the question of why this character should die. And no, shock value does not count, and neither does sagging middle, or you getting stuck, or really anything that comes down to poor planning. I kind of uh, like figured it out as I went, but then by the time I got to the last book in the series, I was like, hmm, I've really gotten myself in quite a few pickles. <laughs> That's not to say that deaths can't help with these things, but they can't be the primary motive. They're just happy little bonuses. But there are some nice audience-sanctioned reasons for spilling copious amounts of blood, and they include the following. Character motivation. My name is Diego Montaya. You killed my father. To die. Death can very often be used as an effective call to action, inciting incident, or a way to temporarily or permanently alter a character close to the one killed. An example of this is Full Metal Alchemist, where without the mother's death, the story wouldn't exist. Or The Last of Us, where Sarah's death at the start completely changes how Ellie and Joel's arcs play out. Death of a loved one is very impactful and life-shifting, and so it's easy for us as the audience to believe that it's capable of completely shifting a character's direction or path throughout the story. Loss is also something that many people either relate to or, at the very least, fear. So we can connect with this on a deeper level than some standard motivations. Although you do have to be careful with the stuffed in the fridge trope, but more on that later. Next up, a change in plot direction. When there's a character who's seemingly essential to the plot, a fun little thing that you can do is kill them. Which will instantly send the plot in a completely different direction. For example, Lexa's death in Season 3 of The 100 added a plotline that literally could not exist without her death. And it's a plotline with series-spanning repercussions. But you do have to be careful with the barrier gaze trope. More on that later. Next up, it can show character. Sometimes you want to show that a villain is super bad, or the extent of someone's moral grayness, and sometimes the best way to do this is to just have them straight up murder someone. Other times you might want an audience to start out hating a character, and having them kill someone close to the POV character is one way of achieving that. Next up we have consequences of actions. Depending on your genre, audiences like to see characters pay gravely for their mistakes, and sometimes that cost can be a life. Sometimes it's the life of the character themselves, sometimes it's the life of someone they love. Early Game of Thrones was full of this, and people loved it. Next up we have thematics and symbolism. There are tons of ways this can be used, but this is also where it's easiest to accidentally have predictable deaths. But although some deaths benefit from surprise, you'll find some can hit just as hard if you see them coming from a mile away. And so in terms of thematics and symbolism, you have things like the death of a mentor character symbolizing the death of security, the death of a parental figure representing the loss of a character's childhood, and the death of a sibling-like character showing the death of innocence. A death can also be thematic in how it plays out. And then we have redemption equals death. 
and this is done so commonly that there's a whole TV tropes entry for it. So there are some characters that have reached a point so far beyond redeemability that the only way they could be cast in any form of positive light in the eyes of the audience is for them to die in a sacrificial way. Or sometimes there's a character that's so bad that the audience just won't accept a happy ending for them, and thus the character has to die. These aren't all of the audience sanctioned reasons for killing a character, but I think they're the most common. Now let's talk about ulterior motives. Audience sanctioned narratively rooted reasoning is great and all, but it's not always enough to be worth the sacrifice of a character. So here are a few behind the scenes reasons that you might want to kill characters. Firstly, it kills the audience's sense of security. Killing characters early in the story, especially seemingly essential characters, adds tension to every fight afterward because the audience knows characters aren't safe. A great example of this is Game of Thrones. Based on how much focus he gets, we're sort of set up to see Ned Stark as the main character, which made his death hugely unexpected and set a precedent where mistake equals death, no matter who you are. Fun fact, in trope terms this is called sacrificial lamb when it is a minor character and sacrificial lion when it is a main character. And when this is done throughout the story, it's called anyone can die, which Game of Thrones had in early seasons, but not so much in season 6 and 7. Next ulterior motive, it can set the tone. If this is going to be a story that ends in really dark places, full of lots of character deaths, you're going to want to generally cue the audience in early on that that's the type of story they're reading or watching or consuming. And you can do this by having an early character death get the audience into the right mindset. Because springing darker tones onto the audience in the midst of lighter ones can give them whiplash and can sometimes feel almost comedic. Next up, it's good to kill characters if it's unrealistic not to. This is actually what George R.R. R. Martin cites as the main reason for why he kills so many characters. If any writer is going to write about war, then I want him to treat war honestly. And anybody can die. And to have only bad guys and side characters die is unrealistic and is called plot armor, which I did a whole ass video on. He also says, I really thought Frodo was dead. I, I thought Tolkien had earned his stripes with me. And it became so much more exciting in that point because anyone could die, the peril was real. Mm. And that's the feeling I want my readers to have, that uh, if you're going to enter- Fear is the feeling you want your readers to have. Yeah. <laughs> yes, actually. <laughs> which supports item one on this list, which is great because he was my example for that. Next ulterior motive is getting rid of dead weight. Now, if a character starts out with no purpose, they should be killed in the drafting phase, killing your darling style. But for characters who had a role and filled it, sometimes you can give them the fictional axe. Though if your audience can tell that you dropped them because you didn't want to haul their sack of potato ass around the page anymore, they could feel cheated. And the next reason is memorability. Tearing the audience's heart out makes them more likely to remember your story, and thus more likely to talk about it and review it and make videos about it. And yes, killing fan favorites can result in fan uproar, but unless the death was problematic, they won't cancel you for it. They'll just send out some tweets that ultimately just kindle that writer flame in your core because you know you like it. Lastly, as someone who has spent a lot of time on social media joking about how I always followed the advice kill your darlings, except I thought it meant that you should kill tons of characters. Oops. Have you ever just <laughs> give up completely? I kill all characters. Dogs included, lol. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Next. I hope you take me dead seriously when I say that you shouldn't be killing characters just to be edgy. And that killing characters does not automatically make your story better. The real secret here, much like the secret in my video on making the audience cry, is layering. When a death has multiple purposes, it feels more justified and the audience is generally more accepting of it. God, no! The third one is ripping! <laughs> oh, I'm so sad. An example of this done very well is Rue in The Hunger Games. Firstly, it kills the audience's sense of security. Secondly, it informs tone by reminding us that this is a movie about children murdering each other. Three, it's realistic as hell. Four, it kindles Katniss's anger towards the capital in new ways and leads to her first open sign of rebellion, thus motivating her. Five, it moves the plot by leading to the riots in District 11, which contribute to the game maker going the star-crossed lovers route. And lastly, it's super symbolic as the death of innocence. An example of this done badly is Allegiance. 
The reason Triss's death ticked off readers so much is they viewed it as one, needless, two, anti-thematic, and three, it didn't move the plot in any true direction it wouldn't have gone otherwise. This made Triss's death feel like a waste, like a punch to the reader's gut for no good reason. And there was some criticism over how you ended the Divergent series from oh, the fans. Oh yeah, criticism you say? <laughs> I've never heard of this before. <laughs> okay, now let's talk choosing your victim. There are some characters that you can't just kill. For example, the children. No one cares about them, they can die. On the other hand, dogs. If you kill a dog, people riot. I kill all characters, dogs included lol. I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> okay, but joking aside, the real big character types that you can't kill without consideration are the ones where it would be a harmful trope to do so. And all of these harmful tropes revolve around representation, or more accurately, a history of misrepresentation. Firstly, we have bury your gays or gay guy dies first. And this is where LGBTQ plus characters are more likely to die than their straight counterparts. This is actually in large part a symptom of another problem, which is that LGBTQ plus characters are almost always side characters, which are easier to kill. Which means the best way to avoid this problem is to have more LGBTQ plus main characters. In Aletheia, I kill an LGBTQ plus character. Or actually, two? No, three? It might be three, I don't remember. But you wanna know how many people cried barrier gaze in reviews? Zero. You wanna know what complaint I have gotten in reviews? The complaint that there are too many gay and lesbian characters. Because barrier gaze only applies if the killing eliminates all or the vast majority of your LGBTQ plus characters or couples. An interesting example of this is Lexa in season three of the 100. As a bisexual person myself, I didn't catch that at all. And I was surprised by the controversy because at the end of the day, we still had Clark and then we had a gay couple and we had some other LGBTQ plus side characters. But I think what happened in this case was that it was so rare for there to be an LGBTQ plus main relationship among main characters that it wasn't the loss of the character that hurt so much as the loss of that relationship. TLDR, just write more LGBTQ plus characters and you won't hit this issue. Next up, we have Black Dude Dies First. I've seen enough slasher movies to know that when the brother goes off to the woods, he doesn't even sort of come back. Troy, make me proud. Be the first black man to make it to the end. Despite the trope name, this trope by definition, at least on TV tropes, encompasses any token minority character. This occurs in stories where many characters die, but where the minority character is the first to die. So again, the best solution is to make your cast more diverse so it doesn't feel like any particular group is being targeted. And the harm from this trope comes from the implication that minority characters are more disposable. Jordan Peele's movie Us is an interesting example of this trope flipped on its head. And then we have fridging. Women in Refrigerators is a trope coined by the comic writer Gail Simone in 1999. It was named for the storyline in Green Lantern where he came home to find his girlfriend stuffed in a fridge, and references the tendency for comic books to have male protagonist storyline be either kickstarted by, or primarily motivated by, a woman he loves either suffering to an extreme or being killed. This was later expanded to stuffed into a fridge to encompass any character being brutally attacked or murdered for the sole purpose of motivating another character to action. Though this trope can be used effectively, it's generally viewed negatively. Some things that make this trope less palatable is the inclusion of sexual violence, prolonged torture or suffering, or when the character is little more than a prop to push the lead forward. Beyond that, the only big thing to consider in victim choosing is the predictability that could emerge from your character choice. Some roles get the axe so often and at such specific points and story arcs that it's almost more shocking to keep them alive. Some character types and death assumptions include Villain will either die at the end or be spared when the hero, who is actively standing on the bodies of the minions they just killed, decides they're better than the villain and thus cannot kill them. Mentor will die in the middle or before the climax because they have skills that could be too useful. Love interest, they will die at the start to propel the protagonist forward, die tragically at the end, or not die at all. Mary Sue will probably die right at the end of the entire series in a dramatic, self-sacrificing way. Where is Gary Stu on this list? Nowhere, because Gary Stews don't die. Young siblings, 80% chance they'll die in some horrible way in the climax to show the death of innocence. 
main friend group, plot armor, plot armor, and more plot armor. And then just a little dash of plot armor just to be safe. Except the funny one, he might die but purely for the gut punch and symbolism. And parents, they will 100% die 100% of the time because their death symbolizes the character leaving behind their childhood. Another meta thing to take into account in terms of choosing your victim is the predictability of POVs. For example, Tristan Allegiant I saw coming from 300 pages away because the randomly introduced second POV in a first person book. Now of course, predictable deaths don't have to be bad deaths, but this is just something to keep in mind. Next up, premeditation. I've seen advice going around all over the place that you shouldn't foreshadow character deaths because it makes them predictable and takes away all of the shock and surprise. But that really depends on whether or not you care about shock and surprise. If the point of the death scene is to make the audience cry and feel devastated, foreshadowing can actually be essential to achieving that. Because of that, most of this section is about emotionally gut-punching the audience, so I'm gonna go super light here because lucky for you, I did a whole ass video covering this topic. So link in the end cards, how to make the audience cry. The algorithm does not like it very much, so click on it and engage the hell out of it because it's one of my favorite videos. But here's a brief overview of things to do to prep for the death. Firstly, make the audience care. If you want the audience to truly care about a character's death, Generally speaking, they need to see it through the eyes of a character they care about. And for even stronger impact, they also need to care about the character being killed. So the most important thing to having a truly impactful death is you need to develop the character and their relationships as if you don't plan on killing them. Next up, we have giving the audience something to lose. Sadness comes from loss. We're hit most by the loss of a loved one when we're thinking about the holes left in our own lives and in the lives of the others who loved them. We see grief and absence. That's why holidays and anniversaries are the most difficult. So to have a death deeply impact your audience, you need to play on this. You do this by making them imagine a future with the character, so when the character dies, the future is snatched away. You can do this firstly in a narrative way by having the character talk of the future. But you can also do this on a meta level by making the audience think that they'll get future installments with the character and then taking that away. Hello the Magician season 4 death that is still actively destroying me. Hey. <laughs> Next up, time your character arcs. There's a tricky little thing about character arcs. If you kill a character at the end of their arc, it's much more predictable. But if you kill a character mid-arc, it leaves loose ends and is less satisfying. So you kind of have to just balance this based on what you're going for. There's no good solution. It's just kind of a choose your poison situation. Next up, time your deaths. Hitting your audience with too many deaths at the same moment can actually dull the blows because you can't take the time to explore the grief and repercussions and let the audience feel the absence. Game of Thrones hit this issue hardcore in season eight. That ultimately cheapened the deaths because there were so many shoved into a handful of episodes with no real exploration of impact. Now we have execution, literally. This is so involved and story specific that it's honestly really hard to cover. So I'm gonna do my best to touch on what I think are some of the most important aspects of execution. First off, tailor the death to the character. A character's death should honor the weight they had as a character. The more important the character, the more epic, detailed, and important the death. And the more of the audience sanctioned killing reasons you need. Next up, research your methods carefully. Google to make sure that what you're killing your character with can actually kill them. For example, if your character stabs someone in the back with a three inch blade, odds are it's probably gonna make them more angry than dead. And remember collarbones and ribs and shoulder blades are a thing and skin does not split open like butter. And don't worry about getting put on lists. There are so many writers out there, I'm sure they can't spare an FBI agent for all of us. Dogs included a low L. Next up, we have twisting the literary knife. You want this to hurt your audience. Of course you do. So twist the knife. You can't always pull this off, but sometimes taking one last thing from the dying character or surviving character can deal a harsh final blow. Have a character arrive just a few seconds too late to say goodbye or to save the person. Have a character die right before they get to see their bright new world they fought so hard to get to. 
If you read Aletheia, this will sound familiar, because this is what I did in that very, very last death that made it so freaking devastating. Next up, stay true to your style, mood, genre, and age group. For example, in erotica, it's generally recommended that you keep your stiffs to the penis variety. In horror, killing for shock value is not considered a grave mistake, and in humorous stories, you don't have to keep character demises dead serious. But you also need to tailor the level of detail and gore to the tone of your specific story and the style of your work. Also, you need to factor in what you want to get out of the scene. If you want a scene to be sad, gratuitous violence could trigger strong disgust, fear, and anger that could override the emotion you're going for. But if you want your audience to be angry, going more violent can be a powerful tool. Next up, don't draw out the drama. He's gone! No, like I said, 10, 15 minutes. It's like when you're saying goodbye to someone and then you realize you're both headed in the same direction. It's like, what are we, what are we, do we say goodbye again? Or, oh. He's gone. Wait, are you just pretending so it'll be less awkward? It is so easy for death scene dialogue to get cliche. Your audience will be much more impacted by one or two hard hitting lines than a barrage of light ones. Why are you doing this? Why? We are Groot. If you love me, let me go! Next up, remember that the world doesn't stop when the character dies. I mean, unless it does. But generally it doesn't. So if they're on the battlefield, remember you, they can't just pause everything to stop and mourn this character who's dying. Unless the death is somehow enough to distract both sides and make them pause. Most of the time, if you want to indulge in a slow death scene, you need to have the person survive just long enough to get away or somehow find a second of peace among the chaos. And remember, you can have the character die fast and have the survivor focus on escaping only to process their grief once the adrenaline stops flowing. And then double tapping. And this one is so interesting that it gets its own title card. Let's talk about the evolutionary arms race of fake out deaths. Resurrecting characters. Don't do it, because I might want to do it someday, and if you do it, it gets that much harder for me to do it, because it is a damn arms race out here, and fake out deaths are the cheetahs. Let me explain. If you look up the list of the top 10 fastest animals in the world, you'll be super surprised to see that number three is a fucking fly, which is frankly terrifying. The other top five are birds, which is even more terrifying. But if you correct that search and instead look for the top 10 fastest land animals, You'll find that number one is the cheetah. Number two is a discount North American antelope that doesn't matter, but number three gets interesting again. Wanna guess what that is? Probably wouldn't have guessed because the name is weird. It's a springbok. But the interesting thing about the springbok is that its primary predator is the fucking cheetah. It's an evolutionary arms race. A co-evolution where faster cheetahs leads to faster springboks, which leads to faster cheetahs. But springboks are still getting freaking murdered by the cheetahs, down at number three. Why? Probably because the horns aren't very aerodynamic. But <laughs> what was I talking about? Right, fake out deaths. Fake out deaths are cheetahs. So fake out deaths are where a character is brought back to life or resurrected or appears to have died but didn't. Sci-fi tech, alternate universes, magical powers, there are a billion ways this can be done. But here's the thing. The ideal outcome of a fake out death is this. The character dies, the audience is distraught, heartbroken, maybe they even cry a little. The characters are then distraught and heartbroken and they probably cry a whole lot. But then the previously dead character rises from the ashes and the audience is relieved and thus pumped because hey, the character they loved isn't dead. There's just one problem. For that to work, the audience has to believe that the character is dead, which means the writer has to go all out in making this death super believable. But then once the resurrection happens, the audience switches straight into fool me once, shame on you mode, and add this type of fake out death to the ever growing list of deaths they don't trust. So the next time this type of death comes up, they wag their finger and say, Nice try, writer person, but I've seen this one before. Which is sad when the writer is attempting a fake out death, but downright frustrating when you're attempting a real death and the audience just refuses to believe it. 
Now this isn't true for lesser characters. No one cares about them, so no one questions that they're dead. But for main characters, this becomes a real issue. And so the more important the character, the more dead you have to make them. Fancy weapon in sci-fi? Yeah, they're probably just transported to another planet or something. Shot and laying on the ground bleeding and contemporary? Yeah, unless we get a solid minute long shot of them blinking open eyes, we aren't buying it. Full dead, but in a world of magic? Yeah, they'll probably be resurrected via some potion or spell or getting dick punched by a god or something. No one dies in fantasy. You just have some characters that are in fake out death mode for the entire series. Joking aside, this one actually depends on how soft or hard your magic system is. If you've got a raging hard magic system, real deaths are possible. If you've got a limp noodle ass magic system, then characters just cannot die. In The Magicians, I only believe that one permadeath Take me <laughs> because the internet exists and it's a finished series. Because holy in hell, does that show have the softest magic system? Like, so soft. Now, does this mean that I'm never gonna use fake out deaths? No. Does this mean that I'm contributing to the problem? Yes, yes it does. All right, now let's talk about the aftermath. This is the most annoying part about killing characters and it kicked my ass in Red River because grief is a thing and PTSD and survivor's guilt is a thing. And they can be a pain in the ass to write because the character can't recover too fast, but they also can't be a useless sack of soggy potatoes for the whole story. This can be hard to balance. If a character is fleeing, it makes sense that they would fall into denial and put off handling their grief, but eventually they'll need to come to face it and have their breakdown. And once your character is through the soul-wrenching part of grieving, they'll hit a point where you can sometimes let them forget about the loss, but you as the writer can't forget about it because there will be things that bring it back up for them. And if a character recovers too fast, they will look like a sack of dick potatoes, which is far worse than a sack of useless soggy potatoes on my potato tier list, which is definitely a thing that exists. At the end of the day, there are tons of different reasons and ways to kill characters. But what you should focus on most is what the death means to the story and those within it. The death of a character is most impactful when it fills multiple purposes, when there are layers for people to unpack, when it feels like a string has been severed, forever altering the tapestry that is the story. And that was it for this video. Check out the How to Make Readers Cry video, I'll link it in the end cards, because again, I think it's pretty great and the algorithm does not think it's pretty great. And I have a special announcement for you. Do you like books that kill characters? Do you, like me, have zero free time? And so do you listen to audiobooks while folding laundry and pondering the futility of existence? Well, then you're in luck. Not right now, in a couple months. Because Alethea is coming to audiobook. It is in production right now. And guys, the narrator, the narrator, she's so good. She is so freaking good. And I am so excited. Also, her name is Alex Ford and I will link her socials in the description. And I have no idea what the timeline is gonna be like. So you're gonna have to just subscribe and pay attention and follow me on Twitter so that you know when it's out. But it is happening and Patrons this weekend are gonna get some sample snippets. And thank you so much for watching. As always, I will see you in the next video. 